Shalom, everyone. Welcome to season two of the Voices of Syriac Faith podcast. I'm Stephanie Kala. And I'm Jenna Hanawi. And today we are honored and blessed to have our patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, His Holiness Morgnatios Afrem Traionu. Barakh Mor, Your Holiness. Barakh Mor. Hello, Barakh. It is both a privilege and a joy to have your participation and your presence in our podcast. We'd hope to have you on our first episode. However, we wanted to do it in person rather than virtually. So we are deeply grateful that you accepted our invitation. Happy to be with you and with all the listeners. So thank you for having me. Thank you. We would love if you could open our episode with a prayer, please. Of course. Shemabu wabro ruhu qadisho hadaloho shariro. Ameen. Our Heavenly Father, as we come together today to record this episode, we ask you to bless your people throughout the world. Bless your servants, those who work in the Syriac voice of Syriac faith, that their work and their labor may be for the glory of your name, for the growth of the faith of your people, and for the peace and tranquility of the whole world. We ask you to bless their efforts to make them fruitful, bearing fruit for the kingdom, your kingdom. We ask this through the intercession of our Mother, the Virgin Mary, and all, all the saints. Amen. Amen. His Holiness Morgnatios Afrem Traiono was born in Syria in 1965. He then entered the St. Ephraim Theological Seminary in Achane in Lebanon in 1977. He then started in 1982 serving at the Syriac Orthodox Archdiocese in Aleppo, Syria for two years under the guidance of His Eminence Mor Gregorius Yohanna Brahim. From 1984 to 1988, he pursued theological studies at the Coptic Theological Seminary in Cairo, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree of divinity. He then took the vows of being a monk and submitted himself to the service of the church where he was ordained in Egypt. That same year, he was ordained to the sacred priesthood in Qamishli. He then served as both the secretary of the late patriarch Morgnatios Zekka I and as a teacher at St. Ephraim Theological Seminary in Damascus, Syria. He received his license of sacred theology in 1992 and Doctor of Divinity degree in 1994. In 1996, he became the Patriarchal Vicar of the Archdiocese of the Syriac Orthodox Church for Eastern USA. He arrived in the United States of America in 1996, and he was officially installed to his position of St. Mark's Cathedral in Teaneck, New Jersey. In March 2014, following the passing of Patriarch Morgnatios Zeka I, the Holy Synod of the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch elected Mor Kirillos Afrem Kerim as Patriarch of the Antioch and all the East and Supreme Head of the Universal Syriac Orthodox Church, which gave him the name of Mor Ignatius Afrem Traiono. He is the 122nd successor of St. Peter in the Apostolic See of Antioch. He was enthroned in Damascus, Syria in May of 2014. Your Holiness, we would love to start off this episode by speaking about our Holy Church, our forefathers, and the liturgy. So can you explain a little bit more about those? Of course, uh, but this is such a broad topic that we will not do justice to it by talking about it a few moments. However, I'll try to be very concise and to the point. We are very um, blessed to be members of the Holy Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, a church we consider to be one of the oldest because we remember, as we remember um, and read in the book of Holy, of the Acts of the Holy Apostles, after Jerusalem, after the persecution in Jerusalem, the, the apostles, the 12 apostles, or, and the uh, early disciples of Christ, ran away from Jerusalem. Uh, most of them went through Antioch and then on to other lands. And in Antioch, the missionary activities of uh, two important apostles, mainly St. Paul and St. Peter, were uh, very distinguished. And uh, through their efforts, the church, the first church of the Gentiles, if you like, 
non-Jews was established right a uh, couple of years after the ascension of our Lord. For that reason, we consider St. Peter to be our first bishop of Antioch, first patriarch, but patriarch, uh, the word term of patriarch came later, of course. He is the founder of our church, which is founded on Christ himself as the, uh, the cornerstone of our faith. So our church is the Church of Antioch. Um, our church uh, prides itself with many things, but especially being an apostolic church founded by the head of the apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, and continued for over 2,000 years uh, in all faithfulness to the gospel. The church that comes to us today uh, is a church uh, that has been uh, nurtured by uh, the blood of the martyrs, uh, people who uh, gave up their lives for their own faith. And we know uh, from even our recent church history how many um, martyrs were uh, sacrificed themselves for Christ that we may receive the faith that we have today. Therefore, it's important for every member of our church to um, appreciate and value this church, this faith that came to us, and to make sure that they, in turn, transmit it to their children and to the future generations. A church that has been around for over 2,000 years, obviously um, um, has rich history, history of faith, and of, of course of culture, because a church cannot be removed from the culture of the people. The church uh, is where we put our faith into practice, but also where our faith is uh, uh, incarnated. So um, a church like ours, which still uses the Syriac Aramaic language, um, the language of our Lord, and his disciples, uh, obviously, is a very, uh, very rich church and uh, is very um, also um, faithful to the origins of the church in general because we are considered to be the uh, inheritors, if you like, of the uh, apostolic faith and I can say even of the... Um, uh, of some of the um, Old Testament uh, faith and practices which were perfected by our Lord. So it's a very important church, not only for us as members of the church, but for the entire world, for the whole Christian world, because it preserves many of the original uh, dogmas and practices of the early church. We have to be, we should be proud of it and we should... Uh, highlight the history of this church as much as we can, as you are doing now. So this is our church that we love and we cherish and we hope will remain faithful to our Lord and to its calling until the end. Amen. Amen. So like you mentioned, our church is traditional, which is what makes us unique, and we're very proud of that. So can you tell us more about the relationship between our faith, our tradition, and our Syriac language? It's difficult to separate these three things mm -hmm. from each other. Obviously, the faith is the rock on which the church is built, the faith of St. Peter saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When, was, when the apostles were asked by the Lord, who do you think I am? So Peter's, St. Peter's answer uh, put, uh, is, is the foundation of their faith. And here I, rem I want to remind especially the Syriac people of a beautiful hymn, we always uh, uh, sing when we get together, Al Tara'ik Ito, no to worry, Koimin. At your doors, church, or church uh, guards are standing. Lilio bi momo, men bisho, notrin. Day and night, preserving you, uh, protecting you from the evil one. Shem'un shetesto. Simon, Peter, is the foundation. Faulus erdeklo, and Paul is the architect. Yohanan, David, Shaujbino, and John, who has become the. Uh, uh, lover of Christ and the church and uh, the um, um, sponsor, if you like, the spiritual. So um, faith 
of the church is, is the rock on which the church is built. But this faith, in order to be lived out, it has to manifest in a situation, in a context. And that's where culture comes. Culture is not only um, social, um, art, and um, sports. That is all part of culture, but religious also. Culture, religious culture is the culture through which we manifest our faith. For example, the way we uh, celebrate our feast days, even our liturgy, our qurobo, uh, the way we um, observe our fasts, fastings, what kind of food we eat, we don't. This, most of these things are not directly mentioned, for example, in the gospel, where every dogma has to, to have foundation in the Holy Gospel, in the Bible. But culture, spiritual culture, religious culture, is the way we manifest, we live these dogmas, these, uh, uh, s- uh, these um, uh, articles of faith in our daily life. Therefore, uh, as a church, it has to, to have its own uh, cultural uh, context and setting. Now, we, Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch and the churches that uh, split from us are proud to also add to this our own Aramaic, Syriac Aramaic language, which uh, puts us really um, um, aside different from most of the other churches because we are still using the Syriac language with which our Lord spoke. But not all, not, it's a holy, blessed language because of that. But it's important also because, as we know, the language is, um, is the um, expression of our thoughts and uh, ideas. Through, through words, we express our thoughts and ideas. And it's important that we are preserving the language through which the holy apostles express their faith in the Lord at the beginning. In other words... Um, it's, um, there are many things when translated into other languages lose some of their meaning and their uh, strength. Therefore, uh, the original language of the faith of the gospel, gospel meaning the message of Christ, it was written in different languages, of course, but one of them was Aramaic, but also Greek and uh, others. But uh, the original language of the gospel of the preaching of the good news was our own. The apostles all spoke Aramaic and they expressed their faith and their teachings through our language. Later when the Holy Spirit descended upon the church on the day of Pentecost, they started speaking in tongues. Actually, they were, I think they were speaking uh, uh, what uh, what they, uh, uh, the language they knew, but the Holy Spirit was making people listen to them in their own languages. So uh, it's important that this language, which was uh, used by the, by the Lord, his, uh, the Virgin Mary, our mother, his apostles is still used by us in the church. That means we are very close to the sources of Christianity, to the original uh, teachings of Christianity. And uh, we um, are able to understand more accurately, I would say, uh, many things that may get lost through translation. But this is not only a privilege, it's also a responsibility, how to preserve it, how to teach it to our future generations, and how to uh, make sure uh, this rich tradition is um, made accessible also to the entire world. Amen. So, Saidna, speaking of preserving our very important Syriac language, You've initiated many things for our youth, such as the Suryoya Youth Global Gathering, which is now, you can say, one of the most well-known gatherings for among our youth. And you also instituted Suboro TV, which is such an amazing and rich platform that truly brings our traditions, our history, our faith to life. So thank you so much for that. And it's also so convenient that, thank God, you guys made an app and we can just download it on our phones, learn more about our history and our faith, and you also ordained a youth bishop. How are some ways that we can better engage our youth with the church, especially in a digital age like we live in today? 
course, the uh, youth uh, and the church, very important topic. <laughs> um, before that, I just want to retract a little bit uh, and say that uh, preserving the language is not only the responsibility of the church. It is, but it's not only the responsibility of the church. It's the responsibility of the family. Unfortunately, many families do not speak Syriac language. We understand that. Uh, but those who speak should make sure that they teach their children also. Those who do not speak, they have to make efforts to learn a little bit, even a few words, to, to identify them as Syrioye people. And uh, thank God at this age of technology and information, uh, we have uh, many ways to do that. Um, um, for example, there is a school uh, in Sweden, uh, the uh, electronic school they call it, I think. Uh, they teach teach Syriac uh, online, and there are other many other uh, outlets also. They speak Syriac online. Our young people should try and learn a little bit of this. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to the youth, I mean, I, I cannot imagine a church without young people in it because there is no future for that church. But the church, but the youth are not only the future, they are also the presence, the present of the church. Oh, yes. So taking care of the youth is a, is a, it's a normal uh, part of the responsibility of every pastor, of every bishop, and every patriarch. We are not doing extra things. That is part of our duty uh, to, first of all, to have our church uh, uh, inclusive. Everyone is in the church. Uh, second, to put extra effort and uh, emphasis on the youth in the church because um, that's the way, uh, the um, normal way to uh, transmit the faith and to uh, uh, make the church a viable, lively community. The church is not a dead entity. This is where many people do not grasp or understand uh, this, this issue. They think the church is somewhere we go, do prayer, attend mass, kurobo, and leave. No, it's the lively body of Christ. It's, it's full of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the, the person of life in the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the person that gives life to everything, including uh, make uh, affects the sacraments and make them happen. So the church is a lively institution, uh, although it's a human institution, but it's divine. It has divine foundations. So having the young people part of the church is important, but focusing on them and uh, and uh, making it uh, possible for them to feel part of the church, that is even more important. And to do that, of course, we needed to do something new, and that's where we started by um, establishing um, a department at the Patriarchate uh, called the Youth Department, and we have, uh, uh, so far we have two bishops. One of them was the Bishop Jack, uh, then he moved uh, to, uh, he's now the Diocesan Bishop of our Patriarchal Vicariate in Jerusalem and the Holy Land, and now Bishop uh, Andrew, um, whom you know, <laughs> lived with you for many years a year. He's also trying his best with a group uh, of young people around him to... Uh, to see how we can better serve our young people, make them part of the church. Every person, especially the youth, should feel that this is their church, not their parents' and grandparents' church, that it is their church. But they can say that only if they feel welcome and if they feel uh, they, can, they, uh, they, they can contribute to that church. And this is what we are trying to do through different things, and um, recently also we have started this uh, the, the Suboro TV ministry, which is also directed towards the youth and others, but uh, this focus on the youth, on the youth also. Suboro TV is a, is a good um, um, outlet, um, good uh, source for our people to learn about their faith, about their culture, their traditions, about the history of their church, and the news of, of, of uh, different dioceses. So I would like to encourage our young people to attend Subaru TV. Now it's not difficult because they can have it on their uh, phone. There is an app, 
uh, whether um, uh, an apple or uh, uh, the other f- Android. Android. <laughs> Android, yes. They can download the app and uh, follow Life Suboro TV. And I would encourage them and not only follow, but um, try to improve Suboro TV by offering that some suggestions for some new programs. And here, since you have this beautiful <laughs> setting for you in this uh, podcast service, I would like to ask you to also uh, start working with Suboro TV on um, uh, on re- recording and uh, uh, executing some programs that can be broadcast through Suboro TV. Thank you. Yeah. So speaking of the youth, it's no speaker secret in the diaspora that we lack a sense of vocation um, to priesthood. So how can we encourage these young youth? Maybe they have a calling from God to become a priest, a monk, or a nun. So how can we encourage them without fear to want to answer God's call? Uh-huh. Yes, there is fear <laughs> answering God's call because we feel uh, our own inadequacy, inadequacy. But we have to remember that a calling from God means also uh, uh, God will arm us with what we need with the tools. I wouldn't say weapons, not a good word. With the <laughs> tools that we need to... Uh, to respond to his call and to be hopefully successful and uh, in that calling. Um, but before that, um, it's important for every diocese, especially in diaspora, to have a focused program to, uh, uh, on vocations, to sit down and put a program, project, uh, by uh, which will of course cover several areas, uh, some of which are already being done, others are not. Uh, for example, uh, the youth retreats that happened. One of the uh, goals of these retreats is actually to encourage young people to search within themselves while we are they are in the retreat setting for two three days to search within themselves and find out whether they have a calling especially when these retreats are done at the church headquarters, for example, here in New Jersey, uh, this day road, Mora Frem, um, having people come and stay here, uh, young people, um, with the uh, supervision of, uh, of his eminence, and the, um, some of the priests are here, this is a, g- a good occasion for... Um, for young people to search inwardly and see whether they have that calling. That's the one thing. Another thing is uh, it's important for our clergy to go around the parishes, especially if there is a clergy that is known for influencing the young people and being able to talk to them uh, in a meaningful and uh, uh, good way, to go, to go around the parishes, uh, talk about vocations. Number three, and this is, um, some people may think it's not very appropriate to say it, but yes, every diocese has to make uh, calling to priesthood or priesthood ministry attractive to young people and assuring in terms of uh, their uh, uh, respect in the community and also in terms of their financial situation because some young people may think that uh, moving to priesthood or adopting priesthood may make them less comfortable financially that should not be there that fear should not be there yes priests are respected in our community and uh, people uh, go to them for all their needs but priests also have to feel that they they don't have to worry about their uh, finances so it's the, the responsibility of the of the every diocese to make sure that uh, there is no such uh, worry um, by by the young people, and uh, of course education, religious education is important all the time, uh, whether it's one on one. Um, young people going to the priest to uh, get educated and uh, to. Att- to adopt 
uh, spiritual fathers for them. This, this is what we call discipleship in the church, that every single person, whether uh, male and fe- or female, should have a spiritual father to go to, to consult with, in addition to uh, to the confession, but because confession is not only going to the priest, uh, sitting there saying the prayer of confession and hearing the absolution, that's a very automatic thing that doesn't really fulfill the uh, the goal and the mission of uh, of confession. Confession has to be more than that; it has to be about discussing uh, one's spiritual life with the spiritual father. Uh, about the decisions in life. There are so many important decisions to be made and we want to know what, uh, how can we make these decisions uh, well informed and, and, and in a spiritual way. It's about asking prayers for different situations in our lives. It's about uh, um, uh, answering questions we have about faith. So teach uh, education one-on-one is important and then um, all the youth activities that we have in, in, in our churches should have I mean, it's not, it's not uh, an option. We should have a part of the activities as spiritual, if not most of it, but at least part of it spiritual and, and geared towards um, leading young people uh, to, uh, vocation, to, to, uh, to entering the vocation. Well, vocation, by the way, it's not only about being ordained a priest. We're talking about serving the church in general, so it could be also male and female thing. Um, of course, female can become always uh, nuns in the church, but uh, that's not all. Uh, vocation is to be a teacher in the church, a teacher of religion. Vocation is to be a board member, well educated about the church and well versed and informed about the church. Not only because most of the times, uh, board members of mm-hmm. our churches, their first, their first uh, interest and. Uh, the first uh, concern is about money and uh, social uh, activities, which are important. I'm not uh, saying they are not, but the, ch- the board member should be also uh, educated in church history, in church uh, um, spirituality, in, in ethical issues that uh, the church faces. So a vocation can be also uh, uh, towards uh, membership of dif- of boards and different uh, councils and different uh, organizations of the church. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, vocation to the priesthood is very important, and that's, I believe that we are, that's what you meant by que- your question, but again, it's broader than that, but mm-hmm. uh, vocation to the priesthood is, uh, a foc- foc- uh, is uh, an important issue, and we have to, to be worried about it, um, we cannot uh, keep importing priests from the Middle East or from any, anywhere else. Uh, we have to um, promote and nurture uh, and nourish uh, local uh, vocations um, because at the end, uh, people who are born in, in a certain country will be much better, in a better position to, uh, to serve um, the spiritual needs of that country rather than bringing somebody who needs a few years to learn language and then uh, start adopting the, to the you know to the country so it's much better to have uh, native vocations and uh, we do see some improvement but it's not enough we do see some vocations especially in Europe from, from those who were born in Europe in the United States, also there are um, there are uh, indications, and uh, you know, starting to see a little bit, but we need uh, to have a stronger uh, movement in uh, in uh, in terms of uh, having local no- vocations. Said now we see and love that you give a lot of importance to Seifo, the Syriac genocide. How do you see martyrdom in our church today? Martyrdom not only today, throughout history, is the um, strength behind the church. Church fathers of the early centuries spoke about martyrdom and the blood of martyrs as being the seed that grows, the uh, seed of faith that grows. Martyrdom gives a uh, 
tremendous um, strength to the church. Whenever there is persecution, um, the church becomes much stronger. But I'm not saying that to justify what happens in the name of religion, killing people. Of course not. I mean, we we don't. Um, encourage people to go through themselves and become martyrs but what we are saying is when 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 uh, need comes when the occasion arises for someone to to witness to their faith even if it me if it means giving up their lives then they should definitely um, uh, be strong in their faith and defend their faith to the end and that's what our uh, forefather have done throughout history and uh, Especially uh, Saifo. Saifo uh, has become uh, uh, some kind of an identity for our uh, generation because most of our people who come from the Middle East have a member of their family um, who was uh, martyred for, for, for our faith. Um, we have people around who still remember horrible stories that happened during Saifu. Remember uh, uh, their neighbors, their um, parents, grandparents by name and date, what happened to them. On one side, martyrdom is, is, is uh, st the strength of the church. So on the other side, um, massacres and uh, persecutions uh, have... Um, affected our church uh, to, uh, to a large extent. Um, our church was one of the major churches in the Middle East at the beginning uh, of Christianity and later during the uh, uh, 10, 12, uh, first centuries. We were the largest church in the Middle East. We had, uh, at one time, we had uh, uh, almost 200 dioceses. Then, uh, but after the, the persecution and the massacres we, uh, we were subjected to, uh, we became uh, very few in number. Uh, following Saifo, at least seven of our dioceses were abolished in uh, what's today Turkey and Syria uh, as a result of, of, of Saifo. And then uh, most recently, the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we have witnessed another uh, uh, great persecution on our, uh, of our people by uh, extremist, fanatic, uh, Islamic groups uh, in, under different names, Al Qaeda, ISIS, or whatever. Uh, they uh, again they uh, uh, killed our people, and they caused the great um, migration of our people from our homeland. Christian presence in uh, countries like Iraq has uh, decreased to less than 10% of what it was 20, 25 years ago. Syria, less than 50%, and uh, the same, same situation of the other countries. So all this um, obviously weakens our church in, in its birthplace in the Middle East. It may strengthen our church in diaspora. That is a blessing because especially that we have churches already established outside the Middle East for over 100 years. So thank God when people come to places like the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, they already find churches and communities they join. That is a blessing from God. But all that happens at the expense of our homeland uh, where our numbers are very weak now. And for that reason, we have to work extra hard in order to make up for that uh, decrease in numbers. Um, we are trying, as a church, we are trying our best to help the people who are in need. And there are so many of them in need now in the Middle East because of the difficult situation that prevails there. Uh, and uh, The people have the church as the first uh, to go to to meet their needs. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful to all our people uh, overseas who are helping their own family members who are in the Middle East. 
that is uh, very helpful. It takes off some of the burden on the patriarchate and the diocese, but uh, there is so much need that um, um, we'd, we'd like to encourage uh, our organizations, parishes, and individuals to contribute to the uh, well-being of their brothers and sisters who are still at home. So because of uh, the small numbers we have, and because we believe ourselves to be the indigenous people of that land and uh, the important component and uh, historically the people of the land there, uh, we are um, engaged in many projects that uh, will confirm uh, this and will strengthen our identity, but also our uh, visibility there. Uh, for example, uh, during the war in Syria, we started uh, uh, a university um, that is open for everyone, especially for Syriac and Christian students, but also for non-Christians. A university that is, uh, I'm proud to say, is a is growing quite uh, uh, steady, fastly, but also steadily. Uh, we started with the three colleges of engineering, of finance, and uh, uh, business administration. Now, later, we added the law school, uh, um, pharmacy, and this year we are adding uh, dentistry. Um, we started with 90 students. This year, we are going to have uh, around 2,000 students. Many of them, maybe two-thirds, are non-Christians, and we are happy about that because this is our uh, chance to uh, to introduce our way of living for the others and uh, to make them familiar with who we are and how we live. And this will, in itself, will contribute to the to the peaceful uh, coexistence in the society. Mm -hmm. um, we also are very concerned about, uh, as, I, as I spoke about the migration and young people leaving, we want to do something to keep them in, uh, in, in the homeland. There isn't much we can do, but at least little things will help. For example, we have a few uh, uh, businesses that we started, created, for young people to find uh, employment. Um, we have a, a very good um, modern um, factory for pharmaceuticals producing medicine. Uh, we own it with some other partners and uh, it's employing uh, over 100, 150 people. Uh, it's uh, producing uh, very good quality medicines. Now it, it's it's just beginning to produce, so we are hoping it will uh, it will, uh, it will be very strong uh, and uh, will provide uh, job opportunity for, uh, for, for some people. Um, we are uh, in the process of building a new school in Damascus uh, for... Uh, primary, um, middle, and high school, up to 800 students. Uh, again, it's one of the largest <laughs> construction sites probably in the city because it will have also a new church and some social halls and uh, uh, an auditorium for 550 uh, people, uh, plus a gym for sport, uh, medic uh, clinic, uh, and so forth. Um very soon, in, in probably one or two uh, weeks, we are going to open a, a building uh, um, that's been constructed uh, uh, for uh, receiving the guests of the Patriarchate and those who would like from our people to come to the capital, Damascus, uh, uh, to visit. It's, uh, if you like, it's a small hotel. Uh, we'll accommodate about 40 to 45 people. Uh, built uh, in a very oriental, traditional way with the fountain in the middle <laughs> and a uh, beautiful place. I hope you will have a chance to come and see it. Okay, in addition to um, dorms uh, that we built for uh, female students who come from uh, outside the city, from our community, they need a place to stay and they don't like to go to the, uh, to the university dorms because they are not uh, that... Uh, uh, suitable for them. So we have a place for uh, about 45 uh, young uh, uh, students, female students, um, staying uh, with a very um, symbolic, um, uh, what you call symbolic uh, financial contribution, like a monthly payment. Uh, so there are several projects, uh, some smaller also, such as a carpentry workshop where we 
employ about 30 people and they they are actually also building the furniture for our new <laughs> hotel um, we have a place we call the kitchen where uh, ladies about 15 ladies come together and uh, cook uh, for uh, orders uh, outside orders uh, uh, and also for occasions uh, when people come and order uh, you know, food uh, so there are a few of these little projects that uh, are helping few families to survive and to stay in the homeland. That's amazing. That's awesome, yeah. yeah. Like you mentioned, a lot of people are still fighting for their faith to this day and taking up their cross every single day and following Christ. Do you have a specific story that you know of that demonstrates the resilience of our people? It's very difficult to uh, single out a specific event or special specific person uh, to talk about the resilience of the people because we have been living this resilience for almost 2,000 years. Um, our presence, uh, as some historians would say, uh, is not short of a miracle, the presence of our church, because we started uh, with the early century persecution by the Jews and the Romans, later by the Byzantines because of uh, church uh, feuds and uh, separations, and later by the uh, Muslims and Arabs and uh, the Mughals, the Ottomans. There was no, not even 50 years that we, did, we were not subjected to, uh, to um, persecution. And throughout this time, our people uh, were resilient and suffered but survived. Um, recent history has shown us also uh, the importance of uh, of uh, staying together as a community uh, in face of this uh, in the face of these persecutions and 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 uh, uh, troubles. Um, last year we had the earthquake in the region there again. The church was the first respondent to go and help the people, even before <laughs> governments. The church was there with the people through our uh, St. Ephraim uh, Patriarchal Development Committee, APDC. Uh, they were there helping people with uh, giving them tents and uh, clothes and food and everything. Um, but I, I mean, there are so many things that happened during the last few years, but... Uh, Something that I can never forget is uh, what Daesh did to our people, ISIS Daesh did to our people in uh, Mosul and in the villages of uh, Nineveh. Um, I, I went to see our people who fled Mosul and settled in the villages of Nineveh, of, of, uh, uh, of of uh, yeah of uh, the Ninue province, they left their homes empty-handed, taking nothing with them. But they were welcomed by the uh, the parishes and the parishioners who were already in these villages. But then, what happened worse than that happened when two months later, uh, in August of 2014. Uh, 2014, uh, not only those who left Mosul ref as refugees, but the entire population of that province were all kicked out of their homes and villages and took refuge in um, northern Iraq, in the Kurdish region of Iraq, in Erbil and other places. Again, I went to see them two, three days after that happened, and uh, I cannot forget what I saw there. Our people, including uh, old women, young children, sleeping on the side sides of the streets in August, where the temperature could reach easily 45 to 50 Celsius degrees. We are talking about 100, 110 probably. Young people, elderly people, were on the on the streets. Some under tents, some didn't even have tents. I went there, I sat with them, I prayed with them. We tried to comfort them. But I started thinking, I mean, these people, our people, especially 
our people in Iraq uh, were uh, quite well to do, uh, comfortably living. Um, then you see them on the streets, no roof to protect them, no food to eat. Was very um, very painful. It makes you uh, question some people's humanity. How can you do that to these people? How can you do? But thank God, that's behind us. Our young people, uh, because of their resilience and their uh, strength, uh, helped each other. The church was there for them. Um, with the help of uh, some international organizations, we were able to help them. And But unfortunately, many of them left because of that, because they lost uh, kind of security and hope in the future, in any kind of future for their children in, in their own their own homeland where they lived for thousands of years. We Syriac people, Syrioye, are the indigenous inhabitants of, of Mesopotamia, of Syria, of uh, Southeast Turkey, of uh, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Holy Land. We are the aborigines of that region. Our forefathers were there even before Christianity for, for millennia. And now we are not uh, able to live in our homeland. It is very devastating, very uh, painful, very... Um, but we can never lose hope. Um, although it means uh, our people are leaving the Middle East, going, going all over the world, we will, as a church, we will always uh, do our best to follow them and providing uh, uh, for them what uh, um, you know, spiritual care and uh, services to make sure they remain in the church and in the faith. Tells you for sharing, Sayedna. We've also heard of the Dato de Slipo near Damascus and in Sweden. Can you share the vision for the revival of monasticism for both monks and nuns? Uh, monasticism uh, has been in the church uh, f- from the beginning, but as an organized uh, way of living for brothers or sisters, separately, of course, to, uh, was really... Uh, um, established uh, uh, beginning of the 4th century uh, with uh, St. Antonius uh, from Egypt, bringing um, brothers together to uh, and establishing monastic life. But I'm happy to, see that, to say that uh, even before that, we had our own ascetic people living on their own uh, in the desert, on the mountains, so uh, as an idea was there much earlier, some people can uh, say, uh, would like to say that you, it even predates Christianity as an idea of uh, living a ascetic life. Yes, but in Christianity, um, there were some monks in our uh, part of the world, from our community, before the, um, uh, the monasticism we know it today was established by St. Antonius in Egypt. Uh, monasticism has helped the church tremendously. Uh, monks always, uh, because they have no other uh, concerns, um, things to keep them uh, preoccupied, them keep them uh, busy. So their uh, f- entire focus is is uh, is on uh, faith and religion and the church. Um, traditionally, the monks were living in in uh, communities, separate monasteries, uh, praying together, um, working uh, in the land farming, um, working, of course, in uh, copying books, uh, manuscripts, translating, um, uh, explaining, and all that uh, kind of uh, uh, educational um, uh, and uh, uh, liturgical work. So they were helping the church, but during the um, uh, crisis, they would go down, leave the monasteries and go and help physically be uh, within the community and help also against heretics and others. Um, that continued in the church for, for, uh, for millennia, uh, for centuries, um, and including our church. Now, recently, uh, our church has become uh, the, the, um, dependent on uh, the uh, service of monks, uh, 
to go and save in the parishes, which is really not part of their calling. Because a monk is not a priest in, in nature. A monk can be a civil person, not even uh, a deacon. He can be just a, a lay person uh, who chooses to live uh, in a monastic community. Uh, some of the monks may be ordained priests in order to uh, serve their brother monks uh, to, li- to celebrate the divine liturgy and so forth. But because of the need, um, in our church, many monks started serving in the communities. And uh, some people started confusing the two things together, thinking that a monk is always a priest, which is not the case. So what I wanted to do is to bring back the traditional monasticism into the into our church. For that reason, we established the Deiro da Slibo, Holy Cross Monastery. Uh, we have a beautiful building that we are still constructing. Part of it is ready. And we have uh, uh, a few uh, young people who, who joined this movement, this um, monastic tradition, knowing in advance that they are joining a community uh, of monks, not of priests. They are. They do not expect uh, to go out and serve in the parishes. We may send them for a couple months to do, or a year to do some uh, research, some studies. Of course, we will encourage that. But they know they have to go back to their monastic, uh, to their monastery, and their to their cell. We call it keloito. Uh, so this is the idea of the new monast uh, monast monastery and monastic uh, tradition we are it's not a new it's a rather rather um, bringing back what we had and uh, this Deiro da Slibo uh, started in Damascus outside in inside Naya now later we uh, uh, established a branch of it in Sweden for our young people in Sweden and in Europe also we have a couple monks there now and we are hoping some young people will join also the young people who uh, decide to um, remove themselves from the world and the worldly concerns and focus on their on their uh, salvation and the salvation of the world through their uh, prayers and uh, and uh, spiritual activities in the monastery. They are also contributing to the salvation of the souls outside. This is the in in a, in a nutshell. This is mm-hmm. what uh, new monasticism or Deiro da Slibo does. Sayedna, what is your vision for the Syriac Orthodox Church and what are your key priorities for our church? Uh, we'll start by saying uh, people without vision perish. We have to have a vision for our church, of course, and for our people. Unfortunately, the uh, difficult situation we went through throughout our recent history has made it very difficult for us to focus on a vision and start working on it. And especially since I I was chosen to be uh, the patriarch, um, I, m- most of what we do is to distinguish fires and uh, uh, and, and try to, uh, to, to solve issues and problems internally and, and externally also with, with all the turmoil that's happening in the Middle East and the wars that are raging. Um, so it's been a very difficult time for us. But it's not an excuse, of course, but it, that's the reality. So we are uh, in, in need of a very clear vision for our church and uh, um, a vision that will uh, um, accommodate uh, and make use of the talents of, most, of, of all of our people in different categories, the young uh, the, the adults, the male, the female, the ordained, the lay, uh, all of them are uh, can contribute and are supposed to contribute to the uh, future of our church. A church that, uh, as I said earlier, everyone would feel uh, at home in, in it. A church that every person young and, uh, and an adult will feel that this is his or her church, not his parents or her grandparents' church. A church that uh, uh, would uh, cherish what we have in terms of, uh, of, of, of heritage, but also uh, forward-looking by uh, making use of the technology and the, uh, 
the fast g- <laughs> advancing advanced uh, information technology that's happening in the world. Um, while we are trying to do a little bit of this and that, but we uh, haven't uh, really set up a, a comprehensive vision for everything yet. And that's what we started working on, on uh, the last few months. Um, we are in the process of uh, um, formulating what we call Vision 2050 for the church. And uh, I'm, I'm going to, for the first time publicly, to announce it. We are calling it Iruto, means uh, Renaissance in the church. It's an ambitious uh, plan, ambitious uh, project. But uh, I believe we can uh, do it, make it happen. Uh, it will uh, set up... Uh, programs and projects for the next few years hopefully by 2050 you would have accomplished that and implemented many of the of these projects and programs it's a beginning i don't want to talk too much about <laughs> it it's not a, it didn't happen yet but it's in the process of planning so um i remain hopeful uh, that uh, with the with the participation of our people, especially the young people, and 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 more specific of those who who, who are overseas. I mean, for for me, overseas that means who are in diaspora, <laughs> in the Western world. In uh, um, I, I remain hopeful. Uh, I, of course, I include many talented people from India who are a very dear part of our church. Also, um, I remain faithful that uh, we can together. Um, keep our church not only surviving, but growing also. Survival is not enough. We have to grow also in, in different aspects. Um, because this is a church that God is in the midst of it and will never uh, be shaken, hopefully. Amen. Thank you for sharing. That was beautiful. Your Holiness, we want to express our sincere appreciation to you for sharing your wisdom and guidance with us today. Thank you for being on the podcast. And we ask for your continued prayers and blessings. We pray that our Lord grants you the strength to continue your leadership within our Syriac Orthodox Church. And we're so grateful to God for blessing us with such an amazing leader. Thank you. Saudi, Saudi, thank you to all of you, voices of uh, Syriac faith. Nahreen, Jenna, Stephanie, and... uh, Rose, Mary Rose, Rosemary, Mary Rose, Mary Rose, Mary Rose, Mary Rose <laughs> is not here. Also, we greet her. I'm ha- thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm very proud of what you are doing. I'm always, uh, uh, I always rejoice uh, uh, when I see our young people taking initiatives, doing new things. That's what we need. That's part of uh, of of the journey that will take us forward. So you are already making that, uh, going through that journey, making that happen. And I'm glad, I'm happy. Um, as I said, I would like you to also uh, collaborate with uh, Suboro TV uh, and uh, try to uh, make new things for our people. God bless you. Thank 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 you so much for joining us today on the Voices of Syriac Faith podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's spiritual discussion. If you have any suggestions to help better our mission, we'd love to hear your ideas. Please reach out to us on Instagram at Voices of Syriac Faith. New episodes are released every Wednesday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. May God bless you, strengthen you, and grant you with his love, mercy, and peace.